Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to IJC's Policy Corner, um, entitled today, From Local to Federal, Moving Immigration Policy in Our Communities. I'm Mary Meg McCarthy. I'm the executive director of the National Immigrant Justice Center, and um, and just honored to be with you today. And thank you for joining us um, to learn more about what's happening in immigration. Um, there's so much in the news right now in immigration, particularly relating to the border and the situation facing unaccompanied immigrant children who are fleeing danger in their home countries, um, primarily the Northern Triangle in Central America, but also Mexico and other parts of the world. Um, we obviously provide legal services to those children, um, both some at the border, but also here in the Midwest. And today we want to talk more about what's happening here in the interior and specifically in the state of Illinois and how um, Illinois is really a model for, for other states. We recognize that sometimes the most impact we can have um, is in our own backyards. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt said human rights start at home. And um, at NIJC, we are really proud um, to work in coalition with many other organizations to protect our communities here. This month, we are going to look at some of the local policy and legislative efforts um, to advance human rights for immigrants um, and their families here in, in Illinois. Um, and you will hear how residents in Illinois have taken a stand to defend our families and neighbors against the xenophobic, xenophobic immigration enforcement uh, system. Um, of course, we're thrilled that we have a new administration in DC that is looking at some of the really cruel and harmful policies from the prior administration and moving to end some of those, but others are not. And of course, as many of you know, some of these policies existed prior to the Trump administration, um, have existed for years. And we're at a moment now after the past four years where we're really hoping to see a transformative system evolve. And we look forward to working with all of you. So today, Julian Lozada, um, our Director of Civic uh, Engagement and Policy Work at the local level, will discuss how the Immigration City Ordinance and the Illinois New Way Forward Act are steps towards building an immigration system that rejects racial oppression, ends mass incarceration, and really advances due process protections for our community. Jesse from Blasa will talk about how the model used in Chicago applies in other local and state campaigns to stop the expansion of immigration detention, which is probably one of the most harmful aspects of our immigration system today. Jesse is the Associate um, Director of Policy in, in our DC office, so he will give a little bit broader perspective. So wherever you are joining us from today, we are grateful that you are with us. Um, and as we continue in a virtual world, we look forward to engaging with you every month in the policy corner and at our Justice and Java, Java presentations. I'd also like to invite you to our annual Human Rights Awards. Um, this year, um, it will be a virtual event on Tuesday, June 8th at 5 o'clock p.m. Um, this is a yearly event where we celebrate our partners, our clients, and the community that support NIJC and our mission to advancing human rights protections and access to justice for immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. Um, it is free and we are excited that um, you will be able to join us. We do require registration. And if you'd like to make a small donation, that's also an option. We hope you can join us and be with us um, at this time to celebrate um, the amazing resilience and courage of our clients in the immigrant community. So without further ado, I will pass this on to Ellen Miller, who um, is the brains behind this uh, event today and many others. So thank you, Ellen. Thanks, Mary Meg, always so eloquent. Um, as Mary Meg said, my name is Ellen Miller, and I have the honor of being the pro bono manager at NIJC and working with our wonderful community and our staff um, to connect uh, clients with legal services and adjust legal system. Before we 
end today, though, I do want to just go through some logistics. Um, this presentation is being recorded. We will send the link to the recording in the next day or so for those of you that are able to join us or stay for the whole presentation. Um, we do have quite a number of participants on today, and so everybody is muted right now, but there is a chat function. So there's a little bar down there that says chat, and we please welcome, um, or we welcome your comments, your questions. Um, we know that this virtual world is very different than my presentation still, but um, we do want to engage with you, and so look forward to hearing that. I'd also like to call your attention to a handout. So um, the team today will be going through a number of resources, and I will tell you, our policy team is amazing. And every month I'm so amazed by the number of resources that they have produced and continue to produce. So this um, resource list is a list that specifically relates to the topics today, um, where you can find more information, you can share it with your community members, and you can bring some points to your representatives when you're talking to them as well. Um, so if you don't see that there, we'll also be sending that out um, in the follow-up email, okay? So now to get us started for today, I know that every month we welcome you back for a policy corner or justice in Java, but for those of you for whom this is your first time joining us, um, welcome. And if you don't know much about NIJC, the National Immigrant Justice Center, I will spend about 30 seconds um, explaining to capture um, all that we do. Um, so Mary Meg said our mission is to provide access to justice for immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. We have five offices across the United States. Our headquarters being in Chicago, where we've been for over 30 years as part of the Heartland Alliance. Um, we also have offices, two in Indiana, one in Washington, D.C., where you'll hear from Jesse today. We have an office San Diego and also a presence in, um, in Texas on the border. What's unique about NIJC is our integral service model. And so, and you'll hear some um, of the amazing impact that we can have when we combine the advocacy and policy work with federal impact litigation, the aggressive impact litigation, um, with all the opportunities that the last administration gave us to litigate. Um, there's a lot going on in federal impact litigation and, of course, um, our direct legal services. So we have a staff of about 125 and, um, and a network of pro bono attorneys that exponentially uh, expand our impact. Uh, we have approximately 2,000 pro bono attorneys right now. And all together across this, we've been able to provide legal services to about 10,000 non-citizens in the last year. Um, and of course, this has the ripple effect for non-citizens, their families, and in their communities, which you'll hear about today. Um, so I'm going to keep going because we have lots to talk about, like we do every month. Um, Mary Meg walked us through the initial agenda items. You'll be hearing from first Julian Lasarve, who is our local civic engagement and policy coordinator here in Illinois locally. Um, and he'll be walking us through the efforts that we're taking to protect communities in Chicago and Illinois, um, specifically through some legislative and policy work. Um, and then you'll hear from Jesse Franzau from Washington, D.C., who will go through how this um, local model is also being implemented and some of our expertise of weaving through this integral service model is also impacting other communities. We'll talk about what are our priorities and how this how this is impacting our communities and then what you can do also to stay involved or to get involved. Um, so I think that's it. Without further ado, though, um, I'd like to just take a moment and in the chat function right now, I would ask you to put in there, you know, we always love to see who we're engaging with. So put in, drop in the chat right now where you're calling from, what city, what village, what um, what location you're calling from. And if you know the name of your representative, either local or state level, who's your representative? If you don't know him or her, that's fine too. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to get you connected today. So Julian can drop in a link in the chat function. Um, but here we're gonna put in, where are you calling from? joining us from and then also who is your representative either state or local yeah 
Let's see where people are calling in from today. Let's see here. Chicago, Middlebury, Vermont. Okay, Gutierrez. Antipowski. Okay, Chicago. Representative Mike Quigley, great, okay. Woo, we have lots of people. Chattanooga. Sarah, thanks for joining us. Diana. Okay. Lou Correra, good. Fort Lauderdale. Okay, so we have quite a vast audience today. Um, and you'll be able to see uh, how some of these local policy initiatives might also be working in your area. Um, I am now going to turn it over to the fabulous Julian Lasada, um, oops, excuse me, to take us um, to our next point in the agenda. Julian? Thank you, Ellen. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining. Uh, again, my name is Julian Lasalde. I'm with the uh, I have the distinct pleasure of being uh, in our Chicago office as a civic engagement policy analyst and doing what I can to uh, advance NIGC's work with uh, policy initiatives at the local level, at the county level when appropriate, and also and certainly at the state level. Um, not just, and certainly not by myself, but in coalition, um, almost entirely in coalition with uh, an amazing crew of uh, external stakeholder partners, um, uh, individuals, just individual leaders of community-based organizations, um, and it's really a distinct pleasure to uh, be a part of this work and represent NIGC in it. So um, I, I know we only have a little bit of time, and I just want to get into it. So uh, what I want to do is walk you all through one of, one of the long-term initiatives that NIGC and other many other uh, partners have been a part of, uh, which recently uh, just earned its latest victory, uh, and, which is known as the Walking City Ordinance here in Chicago. Um, so this is a, um, a policy that has been in place for quite a long time in some way, shape, or form. And I wanted to give you a brief history lesson just to kind of uh, for folks to download and understand uh, what this uh, what does this look like in Chicago over the long term, and certainly why um, uh, again advocates and community organizers and impacted community members in Chicago uh, and allies outside of Chicago have been so engaged in this process and really wanted to see some changes. And so if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so start by, as you can see here on this timeline, what we have here is, is going back to 1985. Uh, so in Chicago, for those of you who are from Chicago or know of our history, um, 1985, we had um, our first uh, black mayor, Tara Washington. So during, the, during his administration, he did issue an executive order prohibiting city employees from enforcing federal immigration laws um, and ensuring that city services would be available to all residents in Chicago, regardless of immigration status. Uh, and that was big. It was huge uh, in its uh, in its time, though it was an executive order. So that was something that uh, potentially could have been uh, undone by any successive uh, mayor. Uh, but thankfully, that was not the case. Uh, and so that sort of hung around in the air here in Chicago since then. And the biggest impact, I think, was in terms of uh, immigrant uh, members of our immigrant community being able to feel a little bit more comfortable to seek out city services throughout the city of Chicago uh, when necessary. Um, and so what ended up happening was that uh, after that, in, in 2006, um, the first version of what we now know is the Welcome in City Ordinance was signed into, into city law, which uh, prohibited, uh, basically put it in statute in city law now, prohibiting city agencies from asking about immigration status of individuals. Um, but besides that, it also prohibited the Chicago Police Department from questioning uh, the immigration status of a crime victim or someone who may, may have been a witness or and someone who called in something, uh, let's say, who was asked some questions afterwards, uh, and other individuals in the city of Chicago. And so that was really big, um, again, to ho hopefully continue to bridge that gap between uh, uh, people feeling like they may, may be in a situation where they need to call the police or contact the police, but also feeling hesitancy uh, based on uh, the ambiguity about whether about their immigration status and whether they would be safe from being asked questions about their immigration status. And unfortunately, they're there's a, there's a lot of, uh, there's a wealth of information uh, which shows that that is a very real concern in the immigrant community, not just recently, but very long term, uh, and is based on very real and very unfortunate inc incidences in the past. Um, and so uh, from that, uh, we essentially would jump to 2012, um, where um, the next iteration of the Welcoming City Ordinance in Chicago 
uh, was signed into city law, which prohibited uh, the Chicago Police Department, again, from detaining undocumented immigrants uh, uh, on behalf of ICE unless they met four criteria. And so those were uh, essentially exceptions or carve-outs that were put into the, into the legislation. And I'll talk about those in, in more detail in a little bit, but it is important to note that those were um, essentially carve-outs that were put in place given, I think, what people understood to be the politics of the time at that point um, and had very real negative impacts for, for individuals afterwards. Um, and so from 2012, um, we keep getting this, these victories. And then in October of 2016, we had the next iteration. So we just sort of continued to add on to uh, through different amendments to the Walking City Ordinance. Uh, we had another amendment which prohibited the Chicago Police Department and other city agent uh, employees from city agencies to uh, essentially threaten or verbally harass or verbally abuse uh, individuals based on their citizenship or their immigration status or perhaps most importantly their perceived immigration status. Um, and this was based on a, a really uh, a terrible incident um, uh, of a Chinese American woman, Jessica Kleichek, who was menaced and verbally threatened by the Chicago Police Department. Um, she was menaced with uh, and threatened with deportation, in fact, uh, despite being um, Chinese American and being a US citizen. But again, this idea, this idea of perceived uh, immigration status played a role in this case. Um, during an encounter in her place of employment. And so um, this was a, a piece of uh, this Welcome City Ordinance, which was led by our uh, good friends and colleagues at uh, Asian Americans and that's in Justice Chicago, uh, and as a part of the what's known as the Sanctuary for All Coalition. So this coalition has, um, has been in place essentially in some way, shape, or form um, since uh, mid-2015. And so that was essentially my first uh, uh, interaction with this group of uh, an amazing coalition of uh, again Im immigrant rights advocates, uh, organizers, impacted community members, and um, back then uh, a very small uh, but very mighty group of uh, elected officials, starting with uh, then freshman alderman here in the city of Chicago, uh, alderman Carlos Ramirez Rosa. Um, and from that, you know, we essentially started to see what else could could be done to strip to further strengthen the Welcoming City Ordinance. And already so much work had been done by 2015. Um, to bring uh, Chicago into further alignment with our values, right, as a, as a city of immigrants, as a city that's welcoming the immigrants and people of all backgrounds. And so uh, what we had was this, um, this victory in 2016, thanks in large part to this coalition, in, in, in total part to this coalition, uh, really. And um, from there, we then jumped into 20, January of 2020. So we had about a four-year long battle uh, with two different administrations, the Emanuel administration, and then continuing on with the Lightfoot administration on what else can be done right, um, to ensure that we are, in, we are uh, further um, disassociating uh, city agencies, particularly the Chicago Police Department, from uh, immigration enforcement. Uh, we know that we cannot stop um, ICE from, uh, from uh, acting in any of our communities. However, what can be done to ensure that they are not receiving any sort of assistance from ancillary assistance, ancillary support from uh, city agencies, uh, city employees, and again, mainly the Chicago Police Department. Um, so we wanna make sure that we were making that divide very clear, not just for uh, the police department themselves and other city agencies, but of course for, um, for community members, right? Um, because again, the at, the at the heart of this is ensuring that people can walk our own streets and feel as safe as possible if they are concerned about their their immigration status or perhaps the status of, of a loved one or, or a family friend. Um, this is also in part because of what was what the country was living through, as was referenced earlier with, with regard to the then Trump administration and the um, sort of next step up in terms of uh, uh, menacing uh, by uh, federal uh, immigration enforcement and that, the sort of the, the shadow that that cast on so many immigrant communities. Um, and so what we ended up uh, uh, coming to is January of 2020 with um, somewhat wonky but really important uh, victory with what is known as the ACT Ordinance in January of 2020. So this actually occurred right before we unfortunately um, as a country and as a world um, uh, were, were hit by this pandemic in, in large part, but we were able to, to gain this victory and this is really huge because essentially what the ACT Ordinance does is bars the Chicago Police Department from collaborating with ICE operations um, and Namely, this includes setting up immigration checkpoints or uh, traffic perimeters on behalf of ICE while, while immigration enforcement carries out. Maybe a, they're knocking on someone's door or maybe they have some sort of other 
immigration enforcement action going on in your community. And often that does require some sort of support to stop traffic, to stop the flow of individuals. And in previous cases, there was collaboration with the Chicago Police Department to make that happen. And so that was a really big sticking point for that was brought by impacted community members uh, um, that were part of the Sanctuary for All Coalition to say that this is a very clear, um, what this creates is, is a lot of confusion again, right? Who is who is the immigration agent in that case? Right? Is it is it someone from CPD? Is it um, uh, is it ICE themselves? And so I wanted to make that distinction very clear uh, by including that as a part of the Act ordinance. Uh, and further, it also bars city agencies from turning over anybody um, to ICE or sharing contact information with with ICE without a criminal warrant signed by a judge. And that's really important because this, this speaks to the process, to the issue of due process for all people in the city of Chicago, which is um, uh, again regardless of what your background was, we want to make sure that we're, we're lifting up this, this, these due process protections for everybody because we all do indeed deserve that. Um, and so this is also huge. And uh, besides that, there's also really strong accountability and reporting measures that now the city of Chicago and the Chicago Police Department must abide by um, if and when they receive requests for any sort of cooperation from federal immigration authorities. And again, that just speaks to how can we make sure that we are, as, as individuals who are uh, residing in Chicago, understand what that connection is and what the attempts are by federal immigration authorities to um, to act in the city of Chicago uh, and what is the response by our elected officials and what is the response by our enforcement agencies to those sorts of um, requests from federal immigration authorities. Um, and so what we have is this huge victory in 2020 that again was somewhat muted because then shortly after again, we, we fell into the pandemic. Um, but uh, that's to say the work did not stop. So. Um, a lot of work has happened from 1985 to 2020, but the final piece that I want to uh, uh, highlight, and if you can go to the next slide, please, is what occurred earlier this year. So in January uh, of this year, uh, the final piece essentially of uh, the platform that was initially started by the Sanctuary for All Coalition when it, it, with respect to the Welcome to City Ordinance was finally achieved, which is the removal of those four carve-outs that have been in the Welcome to City Ordinance uh, since 2012. Uh, and so that was always the, the one seemingly unreachable part of the Welcome City Ordinance that, um, you know, for, for a host of reasons it seemed, we really just could never get undone. And so uh, just quickly, these uh, these four carve-outs and exceptions, um, or former exceptions to the Welcome City Ordinance, include um, essentially mean that anybody who uh, is found to be under these four categories could still be turned over to ICE by the Chicago Police Department without uh, without regard to the due process or where they are in the criminal justice system at that point. But these are individuals who had at one point uh, uh, an outstanding criminal warrant, but these are people, who, again, who are currently in the criminal justice system deserve due process protections. Um, two would be someone who has been convicted of a felony in any court in the past. Again, these are people who've already paid their debt to society and deserve the opportunity just as much if I were to commit a felony and paid my debt to society to rebuild their lives and continue in their communities and with their families. Um, or anybody who has been the, who is a defendant in a criminal case um, for, for which there has not been a, a, a charge yet rendered. And so again, someone who has not been charged yet, uh, that again speaks to the issue of someone being in the criminal justice system, meeting and deserving those due process protections. And the final exception um, prior to January of 2021 was anybody who has been identified as a known gang member in a law enforcement database. And, as for those of you who aren't aware, here in the city of Chicago, there's been a, a, an amazing amount of groundwork and organizing that's been done uh, to shine a light on the Chicago Police Department's gang database uh, with a couple of reports. One, um, one being, or two, excuse me, being done by external stakeholders of which NIGC has been a part of this group known as Erase the Database, the Erase the Database Coalition. But then there was also a formal report uh, that was submitted by our Office of Inspector General here in Chicago. So again, this very independent body uh, which noted that um, the Chicago gang database is just immensely flawed. Um, and and uh, the further digging that they've done demonstrate that this is really some, uh, essentially being a tool uh, uh, in many cases to uh, not necessarily for, uh, uh, for uh, law enforcement purposes and not simply um, something that is demonstrates the sort of uh, racial profiling that we see that we have unfortunately seen in the city of Chicago. So about 95% of the gang database as is today still currently includes um, Black and Latinx individuals. Uh, and um, uh, that is something that we, you know, again, have done some digging on and found individuals who are as young as uh, one, two, three years old, individuals who are in their 90s that are a part of this gang database, um, individuals who 
really there's not much uh, information in terms of how they got on, on the database. So really, it's, it, could, it could be as easy as where you live in the city of Chicago, whether then you are, uh, if you are stopped but not arrested, not charged at any point by a police officer, can still be included in the database. So this speaks to um, I wanted to make sure that we have something in, in place in the city of Chicago that is providing as much protection as possible for all of our residents. And so in January 2021, you see the picture here with Mayor Lightfoot signing the, the, this, this final piece of the Welcome City Ordinance and Amendments into Law. Uh, and with uh, some of our lead uh, um, elected official champions being uh, Alderman College Benitez Rosa and Alderwoman uh, Rosana Rodriguez Sanchez, who were instrumental in getting this final piece of the puzzle done uh, in coalition with, uh, with, our, uh, with our coalition, the Sanctuary for All Coalition. And I do want to just take this moment. Um, I know I sort of raced through what has happened to Moody 5 and now, but I would be remiss if I didn't take this time to really highlight the fact that NIJC, the role that we have played in this, I think is quite unique in that, um, especially since uh, since the mid uh, 2010s, uh, you know, uh, having litigators on staff who could work with these, with our external partners on writing the legislation, writing these ordinance, writing, writing these amendments, excuse me, to this ordinance um, has really been something that uh, NIJC has done intentionally. And, um, and so, you know, one of our colleagues who's a part of the litigation team, Mark Fleming, has been instrumental working with the Sanctuary for All Coalition, and not just sort of as an aside, not just, you know, um, uh, directly working with the, the mayor's policy team, let's say, but being in, in the meetings with Sanctuary for, for All Coalition members, hearing from organizers, hearing from impacted community members, and bouncing ideas off each other, and being challenged, most importantly, um, to understand, right, why we needed every bit of those steps that I just outlined from 2012 on in particular, um, to get us to where we are right now in the city of Chicago, with no exceptions in our welcome city ordinance for anybody in the city of Chicago. Um, and I think that, and, you know, myself being, uh, again, very fortunate to work more so on the policy side with, with those same groups of individuals and the strategy side, uh, and hopefully being able to add to that, uh, not just as an individual, but then also representing an AGC and the institutional reach that we may have with different, uh, uh, different stakeholders, political stakeholders, in the city of Chicago to get that message through to make sure that we um, were able to get to each of these points. And thankfully now here we are. And so, you know, organizations like particularly like OCAD, Organized Communities Against Deportation, Chicago Community Workers Rights, uh, Centro de Trabajadores Unidos, of course, ICER, Illinois Coalition for Immigrant Refugee Rights, um, Latino Union of Chicago, Southwest Organizing Project. I, I could go on and on, but I just want to make sure to highlight that this is something that we were so fortunate to be a part of and so fortunate to be challenged and held accountable through the entire process uh, in those moments when maybe we weren't um, seeing what needed to be seen. Uh, and, uh, and in the end, now, thankfully, we can say we were a part of something that's quite unique uh, uh, and hopefully is now going to be a model for other, other jurisdictions across the country to follow in terms of establishing, um, yes, it can be done in a large jurisdiction as well, uh, the size of Chicago. Uh, yes, it can be done and it has been done. Uh, so I will uh, stop there and we're kind of running short on time and go on to the way forward, which is um, the work that I've been, again, fortunate to engage on on behalf of NIGC um, with our uh, state level partners, uh, primarily the uh, Illinois Coalition for Immigrant Refugee Rights. And so this Illinois Way Forward piece is, is something that is um, uh, years in the making. And again, this is something that we uh, hoped to uh, have been able to pass last year in 2020, but again, because of the pandemic, and the, the very truncated state uh, uh, legislative session in Illinois, and I'm sure in other states, uh, we weren't able to, 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 to get much movement. But this is, we feel this is our year. And this bill is a bill that is focused on strengthening accountability measures for law enforcement agencies in Illinois that fail to abide by uh, existing state law as it relates to immigrants. In particular, we're talking about violations of uh, what is known as the Trust Act, which was passed into law here in Illinois, uh, signed into law in 2017. And the Voices Act, which is another piece of legislation focused on immigrants in our communities, um, that was passed in 2018, I believe. And so, you know, you you know here um, on, on the slide, there's a a, a, a case that um, sort of undergirds what this Illinois report is really about. So, in 2019, a lawsuit was brought against two separate counties in Illinois, uh, Stevenson County and Ogle County, by NIJC, our, the, our our team of litigators, along with the CLU of Illinois and the Suburban Action Project and ICER. Uh, and Access Living Chicago um, on behalf of uh, three clients uh, because of flagrant violations of the Trust Act. Uh, and the Trust Act in 2017 was uh, supposed to, again, drive this very clear uh, divide between local law enforcement agencies and their ability to work with 
um, uh, federal immigration authorities and provide support um, to uh, immigration authorities, commu formal communication between those, those two agencies as well. Um, but unfortunately, what we've seen is different violations of some quite flagrant, others a little bit more difficult to, to sort of nail down. So that information tends to be a little bit more anecdotal. But in this case, this lawsuit was um, three very clear cut cases of, of, of sheriffs, um, those sheriff's offices, unfortunately, simply not abiding by the guidelines of the, of the Trust Act. And, um, you know, in those cases, these are men who were stopped and arrested for minor traffic violations. Uh, and the sheriffs uh, then continued to detain them even after they posted bond and communicated with ICE agents in order to come pick those individuals up at, essentially outside of their stations. And so that, those are flagrant violations of the Trust Act. Um, and I, in one case, there was a settlement. Uh, uh, and another one of those lawsuits uh, actually to this day still continues on. So, um, you know, we can only litigate so much as NIGC, as advocates. And so seeing these sorts of cases really just highlighted um, that there were other, there were still parts of the Trust Act in particular that really needed to be undergirded and strengthened. And so this was our attempt to, um, to essentially try to do that, uh, ensure that uh, there's further protections for immigrant individuals across the state of Illinois um, from inf immigration enforcement and from being asked about their immigration status in, in Illinois, regardless of what, what is happening. And so, um, for us, we, we hope that this is the year to get it done. Um, but um, uh, where we are right now is, as you see here, it's Senate Bill 667, and Senate Bill 667 has uh, has been assigned. Uh, so it's been introduced and assigned to what is known as the Illinois Senate Executive Committee. Um, but there's no scheduled date yet for that hearing. So for the for the committee to actually hear the bill and, and debate the bill, and then hopefully vote on the bill uh, to then pass it on to for for a vote of the entire Illinois Senate, and then hopefully after that onto the Illinois House. Um, and so once that information is, is, is out there, we certainly as an IGC are gonna be putting that information out via our social media networks so people understand where it is in the process, but certainly a lot of our um, colleagues and our uh, stakeholder allies are gonna be uh, pumping out this information as well to ensure that people can, can engage. And one of the ways you can engage, um, I just wanna take this moment is, um, is via what is known as um, uh, submitting a witness slip. So for those of you who've never done that before, maybe there's some of you who have, uh, you know, witness slips are a very easy, but very important part, uh, a very easy way to get involved with an extremely important part of this process to ensure that people that uh, are elected officials, whether in the state house or the state senate, see what their response is from community members across the state to certain pieces of, to all pieces of legislation. So you can submit a witness slip on any piece of legislation that's formally introduced in the Illinois House and Senate. And so we hope you'll, you'll, you'll do that. I know we'll have a little bit more information. <clears throat> there is right there to submit a witness if you go to my.ilga.gov. Um, and again, once we have that information for uh, the Illinois forward Senate Bill 667, we'll make sure to do that. Um, and I do wanna just briefly talk a little bit about, uh, you know, why are we doing this sort of work, right? Um, this broader context, we have the other way forward. We have, again, this, this other piece of legislation on this special immigrant juvenile status, which is a, a, a bill that uh, directly impacts NGC clients as well. Uh, individuals who are aged 18 to 21 who are uh, uh, abused, abandoned, and neglected. But uh, unfortunately, once uh, what we have are state statutes, which says that once you're over the age of 18, then you are no longer uh, eligible for the special immigrant juvenile status or able to uh, uh, file the necessary uh, uh, paperwork and receive the necessary uh, 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 what's known as a predicate order from the state court uh, to, to be able to go on with your with the federal process, which is adjudicated by USCIS in DC. And so we want to make sure to extend the age of eligibility for individuals to be able to apply for it, uh, to receive those orders in the state of Illinois from 18 to 21, which is 21 years old is the federal uh, cutoff. Um, so uh, on federal law, we just simply want to get, get the state of Illinois up to federal standards when it comes to uh, being able to uh, seek uh, a permission to obtain uh, a special living juvenile status. And that really is life-changing for individuals who are able to obtain it. Uh, and we want to make sure they can do that for those who are 18, 21 years old. Um, so those are two bills that we're working on. But besides that, you know, I want to just make sure to, to shout out some of the work that is being done by our, our amazing uh, stakeholder allies and our colleagues, uh, um, namely uh, the public defender, uh, this public defender bill that you see here, uh, Cost Bill 2790, which has been led by uh, the Resurrection Project and Westside Justice Center and uh, in, uh, Illinois Business Immigration Coalition, which is uh, essentially trying to get um, uh, the, uh, um, trying to, uh, is, um, sorry, I'm tripping over my words here, 
it's the largest um, as the largest immigrant service provider in the state of, in the Midwest. We want to make sure that um, all individuals who are detained or people who are living in the state of, the state of Illinois are able to obtain legal representation uh, in immigration court. And that is a very difficult thing to do because the need is always much more greater than the ability of, uh, of uh, legal representatives to be able to represent everybody. And so we know what the, st the statistics are with individuals who are able to actually have representation in immigration court. And this is a really innovative idea from our colleagues to try to bridge that gap. Uh, and so we have already, you know, we're in uh, part of this coalition, which I believe is the leading lady today, in fact, to discuss further where, where the bill stands. Um, and another bill is also this uh, VTTC uh, program extension, which is essentially uh, victims of uh, trafficking and torture and other serious crimes who are here in the state of Illinois um, are currently being provided with life-saving patch assistance, medical assistance, food assistance. Uh, but unfortunately, that is a program that is due to sun, uh, uh, sunset, essentially end in June of 2022. And so this would essentially remove that um, that sunset provision and allow this uh, this program and this uh, this program to continue on past June of 2022 for those individuals who are looking to obtain uh, a visa U or a T visa here in the state of while living in the state of Illinois um, and we want to make sure that they are able to go through that process which can be quite time consuming uh, and can take a while um, and make sure that they are at least receiving the minimum benefits that the state of Illinois can provide to keep them uh, stable while they go through this process. Um, and finally, this legal representation for the teen immigrants bill is also something that is essentially moving through the House right now. And we are very excited about that as well, thanks to our partners uh, across the board that are working on that. And, you know, I, I, again, I just want to highlight that for us, it's we do this work as legal service representatives. I am fortunate enough to work with, our, with people who are on our litigation team, people who are on the legal services team. And it's a, quite an amazing thing to see. Um, but Really, at the end of the day, if we're not connecting to um, external stakeholder partners, these amazing organizations, some of whom I just mentioned right now, that are part of this work on the on the front lines as organizers, as impacted community members, and listening to those real life stories, then we're you know we're only sort of touching, uh, we're only really at the tip of the iceberg in terms of what can be done and what must be done to uplift immigrant uh, rights, immigrant justice here in the state of Illinois, and how we can continue to be a model across the country. And I really do uh, firmly believe that we are, uh, in large part. Um, uh, because of this sort of work. And um, I'm just so proud to be able to re represent NIGC as a part of that work and hopefully add to um, uh, to what uh, uh, is done through these different coalitions. So I'll leave it there and uh, I'll pass it on to uh, my colleague, Jesse, to walk us through what's happening at the federal level. Thank you so much, Julia. That was, that was really fantastic. I'm Jesse Francois, I'm Senior Policy Analyst with our DC team and um, really thrilled to, thrilled to be here to, to talk about the work that we really build on um, uh, stemming from a lot of the important work that my colleague Julian and, and other colleagues do in, in Chicago and in Illinois. Um, so NIJC really has a unique approach that allows for our DC policy work to draw from the great work of Julian and our colleagues. Um, we um, have even had and I just see clients from Chicago come out to DC um, to advocate for federal legislative policy changes to transform the immigration enforcement system. And this is a picture here we have um, an NIJC client named Alejandro Cano, who came out to DC um, for the introduction of legislation called New Way Forward uh, at the federal level, which um, Illinois Congressman uh, Representative Chuy Garcia introduced with other members of Congress. Um, that is legislation that would take important steps to disentangle the immigration enforcement system from the um, criminal enforcement system. And so Alejandra um, has faced deportation uh, herself. Um, uh, she's lived in um, the United States for the majority of her life, um, came to the US when she was just a, to a toddler from Chile. Uh, and was detained by CBP after she returned from Chile. And NIJC is, is, has helped her in her case. And um, she's a very inspirational figure. Has come out to DC to advocate for federal policy changes to help um, others like yourselves. And has also um, advocated for her own uh, community members in Chicago in a really powerful way. So we are able to really, um, you know, blend uh, 
NIJC's legal representation work with policy advocacy, uh, in part by incorporating stories from NIJC clients and using these stories to push Congress and, and the administration to make uh, really much needed changes in the immigration system. So one of the ways, one of the tools that we use, um, we document abuses that are taking place in ICE detention. Um, last week, we filed a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties um, that included declarations um, uh, illustrating medical neglect and calling for the release of people in detention, um, particularly NIJC clients who gave their declarations to really demonstrate and provide um, evidence of um, severe medical neglect that's taking place in ICE detention facilities. This, this complaint was related to uh, individuals in Pulaski County detention. So this is um, a county jail that ICE contracts um, to hold people in detention. Um, and so we took testimonies from people like um, William, who is a 61-year-old who has chronic health conditions. Uh, he's currently facing the possibility of having his leg amputated because um, of the um, because of his severe health issues and um, just really utter neglect and disregard by um, medical staff in the in the in the county jail there where he's being held. He also um, has a sleep machine that he needs to, to use at night, um, but he's in a cell that's too cold, so the sleep machine doesn't function. Um, it's a very dire situation that he's currently in. He's, he's tell, he told us in the declaration, um, I suffer from type two diabetes, hypertension, asthma. I'm a survivor of prostate cancer. I have a family, children, and grandchildren. I should be released to be with my family and receive the medical attention that I need. The, um, so the Civil Rights Office is, is an office that's supposed to investigate abuses that, that occur in ICE detention. Um, so we you know, really need these, these illustrative cases um, to push um, these, these uh, agencies um, to investigate, to call for the release of these individuals from ICE detention who, who should be released and should be home with their families and their communities, um, and to push for, for, for policy changes. Um, with regards to ICE detention, with regards to immigration enforcement, we're filing more um, CRC, CRCL complaints, um, complaints with the Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Office on behalf of NIJC clients to, to really push for accountability and, and stop the systemic abuse um, that takes place in ICE detention. Part of this involves advocating for the White House and the Department of Homeland Security to implement a meaningful case review process for the uh, 14,000 people still currently detained in ICE detention. Um, we recently joined a letter with more than 160 organizations calling for a meaningful review for all people in ICE detention. Um, and we've helped develop uh, resources in support um, recently of national campaigns that are geared towards halting immigration expansion and, and phasing out immigration detention all, altogether. One of these resources that we recently developed was. Um, policy brief that discusses the entire web of ICE contracting, the, the entire web of over 200 um, facilities ICE uses to hold people, which involve some, um, some facilities run by private companies, um, other county jails the ICE contracts with, um, U.S. Marshals facilities that ICE joins into a contract so they can hold people in ICE, in ICE custody in these, in these jails and prisons. Um, and so we use this resource to support uh, an ongoing grassroots campaign uh, led by the Detention Watch Network with community groups all over the country calling for a uh, phase out of immigration detention and calling for the immediate closure, closure of 10 immigration detention facilities. And one of those detention facilities is um, ICA Farmville. So this is a detention center that is the closest detention center to Washington, D.C., um, um, one of the closest. So when people, when our neighbors here in Washington are picked up by ICE, um, they're often taken to this detention facility in Farmville, Virginia. It's owned by this company, Immigration Centers of America, which has been very aggressively trying to pursue ICE contracts for new detention facilities um, in, in Michigan, and in Wisconsin and in Illinois, um, in Dwight, Illinois. 
and also in, in Maryland um, and other places. So we've really tried to support efforts by community groups um, in the DMV area, um, particularly and community groups in other places to, to stop um, ICA from getting these contracts to um, ex expand ICE detention and, and to build new ICE detention facilities um, in the region. So we've engaged with, um, with local groups to develop resources, um, to obtain documents through the Freedom of Information Act uh, and publish these documents that illustrate the long standing abuses in ICA Farmville and this detention facility. Um, and also document the internal financial arrangements between the company ICA and the, the town, Farmville, Virginia, and ICE. Um, and this documentation really helps illustrate the financial incentives that drive ICE detention. We've also documented how ICA, this company, has hired up consultants to try to lobby local towns um, to convince them to take up new ICE detention facilities where this company ICA is trying to get uh, contracts for. Um, ICA Farmville became the site of the worst COVID outbreak last summer um, of all the detention centers. Over 90% of people in that detention center had COVID. And in June, after ICE uh, transferred people from other detention facilities and hotspots in Florida and Arizona to Virginia, to Farmville, Virginia, so they could, uh, so the Trump administration can move ICE agents to police the growing racial justice protests in Washington, D.C. Um, and just really an illustrative um, story showing ICE's utter disregard for the rights of people and the humanity of people in, in their detention centers. Um, so we have been very supportive of campaigns to highlight the abuses in ICA Farmville and um, call for the, the ending of that contract, um, uh, calling for people to be released in that facility, working with local groups, community groups, um, to call attention also to the, to the expansion efforts. Um, and um, we've taken also lessons from NIJC's efforts uh, to stop ICE expansion in Dwight, Illinois. Um, so this company, ICA, um, was trying to also get a contract to build a new private detention center in Dwight, Illinois. Um, and NIJC was part of a, a big effort with other community groups that Lillian works with and, and our colleagues work with um, to stop that expansion from happening and, and to stop this company, ICA, from getting this contract to build a new detention site. And that um, part of that involved this successful state legislation in Illinois that ended up preventing um, ICE expansion uh, and, and preventing the private detention facility from being built. And that state was a really powerful um, lesson in how local organizing um, can really push state representatives, um, uh, state um, legislators to, um, to stop ICE um, uh, from incarcerating more people um, in their communities. And one thing we've done is, is helped from those lessons in Illinois, um, bring that out to also support local efforts with community groups um, in Maryland. And uh, in Maryland, there is legislation that is actually currently being debated today as we speak. Um, the NIJC has been very supportive, supportive of that would end uh, immigration detention in, in the state of Maryland. Um, it's a really important legislative initiative. For the last couple of years, we've been very supportive of this. Um, the legislation would, would end the, the, the current agreements that ICE has with local counties uh, in Maryland to, to hold people in detention. Um, and would stop any new private detention facilities from being built as um, ICA has been trying to do, ICA and ICE have been trying to do in this town of Sudlersville, Maryland. And we've been um, supportive of the, of the campaign to prevent ICE expansion uh, in, in the state and, and to support this legislation to um, stop ICE from detaining people um, in Maryland. Um, I will pass it off now to um, Ellen, I think, to go over a bit of the kind of broader uh, NIJC priorities. Great. Um, thank you, Julian and Jesse. We are already winding down on time, and I know that there's some questions in the chat. 
Um, but before we get to that, I think, oops, my bad. Um, I, you know, there are some priorities here and you've seen immigration in the news and you've heard lots of things going on. Um, and yes, NIJC is doing a lot, um, but we, as Julian and Jesse said, we are doing this in collaboration, right? Because this is all take this, it takes a village. Um, and so some of our priorities right now, as you've heard throughout this presentation, is really to focus on dignity, um, dignity for these individuals, that all human beings are um, you know, treated equally with dignity and respect and the justice for immigrants in our communities. Um, and this goes into the decarceration and decriminalization of immigrant communities, um, that there are alternatives to detention and um, we continue to end these um, the quotas and so much of the detention system um, that Julian and Jesse have been talking about. Um, another priority that we're looking, you know, that we focus on is access to justice for stability and stability for immigrants and asylum seekers. Access to justice can be through our legal systems, through in our communities, um, supporting each other, but also as lawyers, um, or as folks in the legal community, um, that we connect individuals that need legal representation with um, qualified legal representation, competent legal representation, and that we continue to build the framework of the laws and the system in which we are acting um, to be just and fair as well. And then, of course, protection for our immigrant youth. Um, so there's there's lots going on in our youth and our families, um, you know, are, are important members of our community and there's a lot going on right now that are attacking their dignity and their justice and NIJC is working to ensure that they are treated um, with dignity and fairness and that they also have access to justice. We're going to actually hear about more about immigrant youth in May, so I'm going to um, click to the next point here and keep us going so we have some time for your questions. Um, you had a lot of information, always so much information going on. Like I mentioned, there is also the handout attached um, that has more information. So you showing up today is a great first step so that you can be informed, know what's going on, know some of the nuances of the issues, the larger issues and how to get involved. Um, we talked about um, submitting a witness slip, and I apologize for that typo in the slide, but here it is, it's my.ilga.gov if you're in Illinois. Um, there's also ways to get involved with the Detention, Net, uh, Detention Watch Network. NIJC is part of this larger collaboration and there's um, there they lay out for you a number of ways to get involved as well. Um, please share this information with your community members, um, share it with your representatives, talk about what's important for you and what your priorities are and how this is impacting you and um, your and your family, your community. Um, if you are a lawyer um, or part of a legal team, we do have a list of cases right now that need legal representation in Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana. And there's a couple of matters um, when they come up, we look across the country for legal representation as well. Um, and finally, as Mary Meg suggested, we have our Human Rights Award coming up. Um, this Human Rights Award not only is a celebration, but it allows us to keep doing the work that we do. And so we invite you to participate and the registration link is on our website. So, so much to do, um, but I also, we do value your engagement. And so um, apologies that we're running a little bit short on time today, um, but I do wanna get to a few questions. So if Jesse and Julian want to come back on, on webcam. Um, while they're doing that, I will say that our next Justice in Java will be May 18th. Um, we will be talking about kids and families. Um, and so we invite you to join us. Justice in Java is a presentation that doesn't only focus on policy, but also looks at um, the, three, the three intersections of federal impact litigation policy and direct legal services. We'll have another policy corner in June. Um, and then right before our questions, You'll see that QR code on your screen. If you hold up your device to that QR code, you can let us know what you thought about today's presentation. We apologize for some of the sound issues in the beginning, um, but let us know if there are any other complications, something else you'd like to hear about, something that's working well for you. Um, we do take that into consideration. And of course, there's our email addresses. So as Jesse and Julian mentioned, we also have colleagues, Mark, and the other members of the policy team um, that want to support this larger community effort from local to federal. 
um, and keep us all getting involved so that we can keep pushing the system um, towards more equality and justice for these individuals. So I will stop talking now. Well, in just a second, I see that Jesse's on. Um, and I know that there were a few questions here um, for Jesse and for Julian. Julian, are you able to get on camera again? Hello. Okay, great. Um, I, uh, I, I think I answered. Um, sorry, everybody, for those who for so many questions. I've just been having a, a, some trouble on mine, but I think I figured out how to submit the answers. Um, but I did see that there was a question that I didn't get to from Jaime. Um, sorry, let me get there. Uh, about books or documentaries that are specific to Chicago and Illinois regarding immigrant advocacy or immigration policy work. You know, off the top of my head, I do not. Uh, Jaime Gonzalez, yes, since it at 1222. Um, so Jaime, if you're still on um, to that first question, I don't, I'm unaware off the top of my head of any um, uh, specific uh, books or documentaries that are about, that are just focused on Chicago or Illinois advocacy work. Um, but I think if you are interested in learning more about what those groups are doing, I um, I would say actually I would say that there are um, uh, I would recommend looking up particularly the work that is happening now uh, uh, regarding this, the gang database that I did mention uh, earlier um, and its, its negative impacts on Black and Latinx uh, community members because it really does a deep dive in terms of um, those communities as a whole but then specifically focusing on immigrant um, uh, immigrant communities as well that are impacted which are Black Latinx all, all over the place as well. Um, immigrants are not just one thing, of course. So um, there's some amazing resources through the uh, Erase the Database Coalition. If you give, if you were just to Google Erase the Database Chicago and report, there's a couple there's a couple of reports that are really illustrative of, of the issue uh, and the problem and what they're trying to do about it even to this day. Um, and um, and the second question is, what do you recommend for people working in immigration law to to do to help improve immigration uh, policy, given that law and policy are very important and lead to each other. Um, uh, do you, Jesse, do you mind if I push that one up to, up to you? Um, I've got some ideas, but I know that you're kind of more connected to immigration law world in general. Yeah, sorry, just let me pull it up again. If it's about um, just broader laws and policy, sorry, I missed that. Yeah. Yeah. What do you What do you recommend for people working in immigration law? Uh, to do to help improve immigration policy? Yeah, I think there's a lot of really strong, important kind of um, immigration lawyer, movement lawyers um, who really support the kind of grassroots campaigns um, and really connect well with community groups and, and I think support a lot of this effort to, to document the systemic abuse um, and bring that to the policymakers, bring that to these offices that are supposed to be investigating um, abuses, and it's it's a very uh, you know it, it, it's a difficult process, um, but it's important to have that connection. I think really between um, between you know the attorneys doing the representation work, between community groups doing um, so much of the advocacy and organizing, and the groups in D.C. you know doing the legislative work, or groups around the country doing the legislative work. Um, to push our members of Congress to make policy changes and to push this administration um, to really make um, broad, broad sweeping changes to the immigration system. That's great. So I know that there were other questions and I think um, our team was answering them in the back. Recognizing the time though and that there's still a lot of work to be done and we want to be healthy individuals. Um, we're going to sign off here and um, thank you, Jesse, and thank you, Julian, um, for all the work that you do and coalition members um, and those that are listening and for all the work that you guys do. Um, we hope to see you again in May and in June and to be in touch um, via other resources. So thank you very much and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Amy.